Good evening. My name is Mark Weistuck. I'm the interim executive director of the uh, Skirball program. And I would like to welcome you this evening to uh, the second in this continuing uh, series of lectures wherein uh, Skirball, the Skirball Center, has partnered with uh, the Jewish Publication Society in presenting a, an astonishing uh, series of uh, scholars. The, uh, the Jewish Publication Society um, has been in business for 125 years, and uh, it has produced a, 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 an extraordinary uh, library of uh, Jewish uh, books, uh, both biblical and scholarly and commentaries. Uh, it's uh, truly, truly an incredible uh, enterprise. And, uh, and we are enormously proud of the fact that we have this uh, partnership uh, starting this year, and hopefully it will go on uh, in successive years we're in um, the Jewish Publication Society, as it publishes new works by scholars, will launch those works uh, here at the Skirball Center. And uh, we will have the opportunity in New York to uh, hear from uh, those scholars and uh, learn firsthand about the work that they did uh, for uh, these publications. This evening, we have uh, Dr. Kugel, and uh, there, uh, this is, uh, he is here as one of the editors of an, a, a, a massive, monumental uh, publication, a three-volume set of uh, 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 books, as well as commentaries on those books uh, relating to Jewish writings outside of the canon. Uh, you will have an opportunity at the end of the lecture to take a look at this three-volume set. I don't think you'll be able to actually purchase one and take it home with you because uh, in actuality it hasn't been released yet. It's about to be released. We're, what you see here tonight as, the, uh, as a sample of the uh, publication is um, probably going to be released in December, early December. And um, you're welcome to make an advance purchase. And uh, Dr. Kugel will be in, in the lobby and will sign a book plate that you can eventually put in the book that you order. The, uh, I want to call your attention to the fact that uh, there are several additional uh, lectures coming up this year. And there is a flyer that's available again in the lobby that describes uh, the next uh, uh, four uh, lectures. And we hope that, that uh, you'll pick up the uh, brochure and come back for each of these uh, lectures. At this point, I would like to introduce uh, our senior rabbi, uh, Rabbi Joshua Davidson, to introduce our speaker for this evening. Thank you. Thank you to Dr. Mark Weistock, our wonderful administrative vice president who this year has stepped in to direct our Skirball Center. And thank you as well to Elisa schindler Frankel, Skirball's managing director, Ra Rachel Dulitz, its program director. And thank you to Rabbi Barry Schwartz and Sarah Siegel for this extraordinary partnership between JPS and Emmanuel. It gets better and better as tonight we welcome one of the great biblicists of our time. Dr. James Kugel began his teaching career at City University where he received his PhD before moving to Harvard, then Yale as assistant professor of religious studies and comparative literature, and then back to Harvard as star professor of Hebrew literature. After more than 20 years there, he retired in 2003 to become pro professor of Bible at Bar Ilan University in Israel, where he also served as chairman of the Bible department. He's now Professor Emeritus. A specialist in Tanakh 
and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dr. Kugel is the author of more than 70 research articles and 14 books, including The Idea of Biblical Poetry, In Potiphar's House, On Being a Jew, and the award-winning The Bible as It Was. His more recent books, other than Outside the Bible, include The God of Old, The Ladder of Jacob, How to Read the Bible, which received the National Jewish Book Award for the Best Book of 2007, In the Valley of the Shadow, and A Walk Through Jubilees. He is a member of the Society of Biblical Literature and Editor-in-Chief of Jewish Studies and Internet Journal, and tonight he is ours, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. James Kugel. Thanks so much uh, for that introduction, and thanks uh, so much for uh, inviting me to speak here uh, this evening. It's really a, a great honor. I, um, I wanted to, I, I do want to talk something about uh, my own uh, special interest in ancient biblical interpretation. Uh, but before that, if you don't mind, I'd like to say a few words about the book that I've been working on for a little more than the last 10 years, uh, along with my colleagues, uh, Louis Feldman and Lawrence uh, Schiffman. Um, the book, it turns out, uh, has the same initials as uh, off-track betting, OTB. Yeah. <laughs> this emerged, you know, in our correspondence, because uh, <laughs> uh, people don't like to send emails and keep quoting the same thing. So. So it became OTB, and I, indeed there is something a little risky about uh, outside the Bible as well. The reason is that people, um, ordinary people, but also certainly scholars, tend to be conservative. They have a set picture of things, and trying to get them to see things a bit differently is always something of an iffy undertaking. The something that we are proposing to re-examine in this case is an amorphous collection of writings uh, from the end of the biblical period, sometimes called the Second Temple Period. These writings consist of ancient apocalypses and prophetic visions, retellings of biblical stories, biblical commentaries, ancient prayers, collections of rules of proper conduct, wise sayings, and a good deal more. I mean, it's just a whole library of different texts. But what they all have in common is that although they stem from Jewish authors who wrote in the late biblical period, uh, none of them made it into the Jewish Bible. That's why they are OTB, outside the Bible. So how do we happen to possess these texts at all? Well, some of them, a great many, really, were translated into Greek uh, by the earliest Christians. These books, for one reason or another, tended to be uh, neglected uh, by Jews themselves, especially after uh, the rabbis, uh, our spiritual ancestors, said uh, uh, that it was forbidden to uh, study them. So they basically, although most of them were written in Hebrew or Aramaic, they basically dropped out of circulation in those languages. Um, the first Christians were, of course, Jews, uh, but they didn't feel in any, any necessity to um, obey this decree of the rabbis, and so uh, uh, they considered these books uh, sacred, at least some of them, and, um, and they were quickly translated into Greek um, and uh, preserved by Christians over the centuries. These include books like The Wisdom of Ben Sira, or the Wisdom of Solomon. I, I suspect most of you have never heard of these, but the Wisdom of Solomon, or it's also called the Book of Solomon, is actually um, included uh, in a lot of um, uh, Christian Bibles. Uh, and so is Ben Sira, who's called in there usually Ben Sirach. Um, the books of 1 and 2 Maccabees uh, also were incorporated into uh, Christian Bibles. Most of them ended up being translated into Latin, among other languages, and so they were uh, kept by uh, Christians in, in the West, in Western Europe, uh, and elsewhere. 
other texts in this group, while they were not ultimately part of anyone's biblical canon, uh, certainly were considered sacred texts for a while by, by one or another uh, Christian group. And as a result, their words have been preserved in dusty libraries in Ethiopia or Italy, uh, Greece or Romania or the Balkan states. So that's where this kind of material comes from. And then, of course, there are the Dead Sea Scrolls, an amazing cache of ancient Jewish writings in Hebrew and Aramaic and a little Greek that were deposited in caves along the shores of the Dead Sea. These um, manuscripts miraculously preserved in those caves for two millennia, and not for two millennia, but for about two decades. I used to tell students it was because uh, they, they survived because the, the, this area, the Dead Sea, is the lowest uh, you know, level, below sea level of, of land on, on the earth. Uh, but then uh, it turns out that was not true, so I apologize for that misinformation. They were preserved. I mean, certainly that location helped, but they were preserved there uh, mainly because uh, the uh, climate there is very constant. It doesn't change much. And if you go to Israel as a tourist, uh, if you go in the winter, there's not, not, you know, a lot of stuff is rainy and unpleasant, but you can go down there uh, to the Dead Sea and it'll be nice and warm um, no, no matter what. And inside these caves, uh, there was a very constant uh, co uh, temperature and also level of humidity. And it's really thanks to that that we know them. These manuscripts started to be discovered in 1947, and they ultimately have yielded fragments of some 800 or so individual compositions in many of the types of writing that I mentioned, retellings of biblical stories, codes of conduct uh, for members of the Dead Sea community where they were stored, uh, wisdom literature, prayers, and so forth. So our project in putting together this book uh, was to assemble the most important of these texts, not just the Dead Sea Scrolls, but all the texts that I mentioned. That's a library that's much bigger than our Bible. Um, and to recruit a team of, as it turned out, you know, more than 60, I hear Barry saying 70, I, I'm not sure, it sounds sort of a, a kind of biblical typological number, but it must be around there. Um, scholars to translate these texts into English and to write an introduction and brief um, commentary for each text. This was a massive um, undertaking. It's really much easier to write your own stuff than to try to get someone else to write his or hers. And in the academic world, where the phrase rush job refers to something six months away, Getting our colleagues to submit their material on time usually involved endless emails, threats, and harassment, and alas, sometimes reassigning a text from a recalcitrant author to someone new. But that is not what I had in mind a minute ago when I said that creating our own OTB was a bit risky. The risk comes from the whole new approach to these texts, one that is likely to surprise, but we hope ultimately win over a broad spectrum of readers, Jews and Christians, scholars, students, and educators everywhere. Uh, let me start with the Jews. For centuries and centuries, the Jewish canon of approved religious writings has been well established. The Hebrew Bible, the Mishnah, a collection of early Jewish law, the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds, many Midrashic collections, and the writings of various uh, medieval sages. The material that we have collected was uh, generally off limits, outside the Bible and outside everything else. Many learned Jews in different periods were aware of the existence of some of them, uh, but they were usually referred to by the Mishnaic phrase, Hasifarim achitzonim, the outside books. Indeed, the Mishnah essentially, as I mentioned, forbids studying these outside books. And while it does not give us any kind of list of which books fall under this rubric, certainly many of the texts in our book must have been included in this category. So as far as traditional Judaism is concerned, our mission is nothing less than to return this vast volume of writings to its proper place on the Jewish bookshelf. 
Of course, numerous Orthodox rabbis have already opined that the Mishnah's ban on studying this material is no longer in effect. It's not very likely that modern Jewish readers uh, will be moved by our book to reestablish an extremist movement such as that reflected in the Dead Sea Scrolls, or that they will seek to uh, resurrect the calendrical system espoused by the author of the Book of Jubilees. But there's a bit of daylight between permitted reading and recommended reading, and our aim, as far as our Jewish readership is concerned, uh, is to move this ancient material into the recommended category so that eventually it will find its place in the libraries of synagogues and other institutions. Uh, but more than that, it will be the subject of courses taught in synagogues and study groups. Indeed, we hope that any Jewish home that has a decent library of Jewish books will put ours right up there next to their canonical texts, the Bible, the Mishnah, and so forth. Why should this happen? Well, to begin with, because these books fill a great chronological uh, gap between the last parts of the Hebrew Bible written in the second century before the Common Era and the earliest rabbinic texts, the Mishnah and so forth, were, um, uh, were established only 400 or so years later. So this is uh, really going to fill um, that gap. <clears throat> Well, I should say, when, when I was at Harvard, you know, you're often asked to write recommendations um, uh, for students that uh, you really can't recommend. So we developed a whole kind of um, set of codes. You know, we'd say, uh, this student got through our program effortlessly, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but another common one was uh, his dissertation fills a much needed gap. Uh, think about it. <laughs> um, but this is not a much needed gap. It needed to be filled. And um, those 400 years um, represent a crucial time in Jewish history, the time when many of our most characteristic, the most characteristic elements of our form of Judaism were first taking shape. So our book is, I think, the first attempt to read this material in a very self-consciously Jewish way, tracing all the connections these texts have back to the Bible itself, and at the same time, um, moving forward to things found in the Mishnah and the Babylonian Talmud and so forth. I could go on about this aspect of the book because it is, I think, the most strikingly new thing about it. It's very Jewish approach to commenting on this material. But before getting to some of the examples on the handout, I did want to say that our book is not strictly aimed at a, a Jewish audience by any means. Christian scholars have always been interested in at least some of the material that we have uh, collected. Remember, it was preserved by Christians in, in, in the New Testament and uh, in other collections of writings. But understandably, what interested them most for, um, was the light that these sh texts might shed on the beginnings of, uh, of Christianity, especially on the New Testament. Uh, reading our book will thus have a certain amount of shock value, I think, to such scholars. After all, the first Christians were, for the most part, Jews, and a lot of what is Jewish about early Christianity shines through our texts and commentaries uh, looking forward. Uh, uh, to uh, early Christianity. I may be wrong, but I think that this somewhat different way of reading these texts will rather quickly make its way from scholars to ordinary readers through sermons and church-sponsored courses and study groups. And by the same token, we hope that our book will uh, have a marked effect on the whole way that Judaism and Christianity are taught in colleges and universities around the country. This material really is the missing link between these two religions, and the time has come for that material to be studied for what it is, a great body of Jewish writings, utterly Jewish writings, connected to both rabbinic Judaism and, the, and Christianity that grew out of it. I could go on with this infomercial, but I'd really uh, like to talk uh, about the text on the handout. One of the things that emerges from the study of these texts is how much they are all concerned with biblical interpretation. They may be written in the various literary genres I mentioned, um, uh, but uh, 
Uh, surprisingly, many of them reflect this period's ongoing fasc fascination with explaining biblical texts, especially with answering questions that arise out of the, uh, from the Torah, from its stories and from its laws. The first text on your sheet is from an interesting source, the Jewish historian Josephus, uh, who lived in the latter part of the first century of the Common Era. Um, Josephus was many things. He was a Kohen, a priest, uh, who served in the Jerusalem temple. He was uh, a, a horrible general who ended up surrendering to the Romans. He was the author of two great books, really thanks to that surrender, uh, that were written in Greek, um, one called The Jewish War and the other called The Book of Jewish Antiquities. And uh, as my own early Greek teacher said about uh, those two books, uh, he no speak of the Greek too good. But uh, <laughs> he, uh, he did for a, some sections have a, uh, apparently some sort of ghostwriter because the style goes way up. But um, in the latter book, the book of Jewish antiquities, uh, he retells Jewish history, starting with the Bible and ending in his own times. The first uh, item on the handout is his account of the famous story of Cain and Abel, which I think I printed up here, but I'll quickly summarize. As you know, Cain and Abel were brothers, the two sons of Adam and Eve. Cain was a farmer and, Adam, uh, and uh, Abel was a shepherd. Uh, and then at one point, uh, they decide to bring sacrifices to God. And uh, for reasons that aren't explained, uh, God prefers uh, uh, Abel's sacrifice to Cain's. And um, uh, Cain flies into a rage and kills his brother Abel. And God says, uh, uh, where's Abel? And uh, Cain says, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? Certainly a famous uh, question. And then God says, hark. Um, I, that sounds like your brother's blood that's crying up out of the ground. Uh, well, that's basically the biblical story. And I'm sure you can imagine uh, some of the questions it raised for ancient readers. But if you can't, you can get a good idea of it just by looking at uh, what Josephus has to say. I'll, I'll read this along with you. Two male children were born to them. The first was called Cain, them being Adam and Eve. The first was called Cain, whose name being interpreted means acquisition. And the second, Abel, meaning nothing. <laughs> well, um, uh, they also had daughters. Um, you probably don't remember these daughters. So they're not mentioned in the biblical story at all, as you can see. In fact, everybody had the same question, where did we come from if they only had two sons? Uh, and so uh, from a very early period, uh, uh, people concluded that uh, they must have had daughters and they were just not, for some reason, mentioned in the biblical text. Uh, so uh, Josephus, I, I should say, um, he was, he was, he was an, uh, quite an intelligent fellow, um, but... Um, uh, he, uh, this really wasn't his field. Um, he uh, uh, knew what he had been taught as a child and as a young man about these texts. And when he started his book, he said, well, I'm just going to tell you what it says in the scriptures. Uh, but of course, that isn't what he does. He tells you what it says in the scriptures as they were interpreted already by ancient biblical interpreters. So, um, there's a lot of stuff here that you won't find in the Bible. This is just one example. They, they had daughters. Now, the brothers took pleasure in different pursuits. Abel, the younger, had respect for justice and believing that God was with him in all his actions, uh, paid heed to virtue. He led the life of a shepherd. Cain, on the contrary, was thoroughly depraved and had an eye only to gain. He was the first to think of plowing the so soil and he slew his brother for the following reasons. The brothers, having decided to sacrifice to God, Cain brought the fruits of the, of the tilled earth and of the trees. Abel came with milk and the firstlings of his flocks. This was the offering 
uh, found more favor with God, who is honored by things that grow spontaneously and in accordance with natural laws and not by the products of forced, uh, products forced from nature by the ingenuity of grasping man. This actually sounds pretty bad. Uh, I can't imagine that Josephus really thought farmers were so wicked, but he had to find a reason for you know, to explain why uh, Abel's sacrifice was uh, accepted by God and Cain's was turned down. And this is what he came up with. They, uh, they were sort of typologically representing two different things, uh, you know, uh, a kind of grasping man as opposed to the bounties of nature. Thereupon Cain, incensed at God's preference for Abel, slew his brother and hid his corpse, thinking to escape detection. Well, what do you think? I mean, I'll pause here. What, what would you suppose was the major question arising out of the story of Cain and Abel? And, you know, if you're anything like Harvard undergraduates, you'll give the wrong answer. So I won't give you a chance to answer. Uh, um, no, people think it's, oh, it's all about, uh, you know, murder. No, the, the real problem um, with, uh, with this story was the question that God asks uh, towards the end. After Cain has, has killed Abel, he says, uh, where's your brother Abel? As if he doesn't know. Uh, and then, you know, he gets a little closer, apparently. He says, wait a minute. I hear your brother's blood crying out from the ground, uh, which was hard enough to explain. How does blood cry out from the ground? But also, it, again, it seemed to s s second solidify uh, the impression that uh, God really didn't know what had happened. So Josephus, in retelling this story, and again, he isn't making this stuff up. He, this is what he learned in school. Um, he's really out to say, uh, no, God did know everything. So that's why he says uh, what he says next, um, uh, uh, that, Abel, uh, that Cain slew Abel uh, and hid his corpse, thinking to escape detection. But God, aware of the deed, came to Cain and asked him whither his brother had gone since for many days he had not seen him, uh, who, whom he had constantly before beheld in Cain's company. Cain, in embarrassment, having nothing to reply to God, at first declared that he too was perplexed at not seeing his brother, and then enraged at the um, insistent pressure and strict inquiries of God, said that uh, he was not his brother's guardian to keep watch over his, person's, his person and his action. <clears throat> Upon that word, God now accused Cain of being his brother's murderer, saying, I marvel that, that thou canst not tell what has become of a man whom thou thyself hast destroyed. Um, well, that's, you know, that's wonderful. I, I, it doesn't really capture the... <laughs> flavor of the Greek. It's much too good English, but also, um, you know, I, I, when he says he wasn't his brother's guardian, actually the Greek says uh, he wasn't his brother's paedagogos, uh, which is related to our word uh, meaning pedagogue, but, uh, but in, in Greek the paedagogos was really uh, just a slave who brought the children to school. Uh, you know, he might help them with their homework, but basically the paedagogos was the, you know, kind of babysitter. So that's what he says, am I my brother's? It doesn't say that in the Bible, but this is uh, Josephus' rephrasing of it. Am I my brother's babysitter or, and he adds here, or his uh, bodyguard to keep watch over his person and his actions. Um, well, uh, so that's a wonderful sort of retelling. He actually has answered the, the main question that people had. Did, did God not know? And of course he knew. Of course he knew. In fact, if you go back to um, uh, his description of the two brothers on the left-hand side, it says, Abel, the younger, had respect for justice and believing that God was with him in all his actions. So he's already setting that up as if to say, yeah, anybody knows that God is there watching. Um, it's just that uh, Cain uh, wasn't aware of that. But how do you explain what he says here? Um, uh, God, aware of the deed, came to Cain, asked him wh whither his brother had gone since for many days he had not seen him and so forth. And Cain, at first uh, embarrass in embarrassment, having nothing to reply to God, at first declared that he too was perplexed 
at not seeing his brother, and then enraged at the insistent pressure and strict inquiries of God, said that he was not his brother's babysitter and so forth. Well, where is he getting this? I mean, you know, you know, is he just making this up? And of course, the great you know, lesson I've learned about ancient biblical interpreters is they never say that because they never do that. Whatever they say sounds very fanciful. And I'm, I'm pleased to say, uh, you know, that's uh, <clears throat> when anybody really bothered to write about this stuff, uh, they would say, oh, it has, it's full of flights of fancy and so forth. But, but uh, it isn't. It's all biblical interpretation. There's something always in the text that uh, gave him the right to say what he said. And in this case, as you probably won't guess, um, it, it was the fact that, um, that when God says, where's, uh, where's your brother uh, uh, Abel? He says, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? To Josephus, or rather to the interpretive tradition that he's quoting, uh, this sounded like two answers to the same question. I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? So he just separated those in time. He said, at first, you know, God said to him, <clears throat> Where, where's your brother? And he was like, you know, I, I don't know, you know, he just kind of disappeared. I, and, uh, you know, there aren't a lot of people on earth at this point. <laughs> so, so that wasn't a really good answer. And, you know, God says to him, you know, but how can that be? You know, I always used to see you two guys together, Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel. <laughs> now, Cain. <laughs> So, you know, where's Abel? And finally, you know, after grilling him with these questions, finally Abel uh, came, blurts out this sentence, you know, I'm not his babysitter, which really sort of revealed his true character. And at that point, God said, well, you know, I know where he is, and you killed him. And uh, so that's, uh, that's Josephus. I, I feel a little guilty about having these authors come and go like boxcars at a railroad crossing. But um, we don't have much time, so I'll do the best I can. The, the next um, passage I wanted to talk about uh, concerns Abraham's departure. God suddenly says to Abraham, uh, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that it will be a blessing, it should be. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So if you're an ancient reader of the Bible, um, this passage immediately raises a question in your own mind. Um, and it is, you know, well, why is God promising him all these good things? This is actually the very first time we hear anything about Abraham other than his being mentioned in a genealogical table in the previous passage. Uh, but um, suddenly God says, I'll do all these wonderful things for you. Well, why, uh, well, why would he say that? What, what had Abraham done? And of course, you can look all around you know, the book of Genesis and there's nothing that will tell you uh, uh, the reason. But these ancient interpreters didn't just look all around the book of Genesis. They looked all around the Bible, or what was going to be the Bible, um, because it hadn't all its contents hadn't yet finally been determined. But there is a book uh, after the Torah called the book of Joshua. And here it says the following, And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, <clears throat> long ago your ancestors, Terach and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. Well, at first uh, this really doesn't... <laughs> seem to supply any good thing that Abraham did. It says that um, Terach and his sons Abraham and Nahor served other gods. There's really nothing you can do that's worse in the Hebrew Bible than serving other gods, serving meaning worshiping other gods. Um, but there's a kind of um, uh, contradictory flavor that arises out of um, 
this sentence and the one that follows. It, it seems to be a kind of glaring non sequitur. They served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from there, from beyond the room. Well, why would you take him if he's worshiping these other gods and doing the worst thing in the world? And out of this non sequitur developed a, a tradition that at some point Abraham must have stopped worshiping other gods. He, because after all, God doesn't take his father Terah and he doesn't take his brother Nahor. He just says, and I took Abraham. So Abraham must have uniquely done something to separate him from the other two. They continued to serve other gods, but Abraham didn't. And that's when God said to him, you know, go from your country. The thing in the first paragraph, go from your country, your kindred, and so forth. So this <clears throat> is a very old tradition. And it's really the basis for something, again, that we never really read in the Bible, that Abraham was the first monotheist, the first person to um, believe and propagate the idea that there is only one God and that all other gods are nonsense. Uh, I think the earliest literary reference to this tradition is found in the book of Judith, a book, again, not in our canon, but it is in Christian Bibles. And you can hear it in these, um, well, I, I should explain, in, in the, the book of Judith, as you probably know from all those wonderful Renaissance paintings, is this, you know, uh, heroine who ends up killing the bad guy, uh, Holofernes, and saving the land of Judah. Um, but um, on the way to invading the land of Ju uh, Judah, Holofernes asks his allies, does anybody know who these Jews are? And what you're um, about to read, uh, is the answer he gets from one of his generals. This people, the Jews, is descended from the Chaldeans, the people who live in the east. At one time, they lived in Mesopotamia, by which he means uh, down in um, uh, the land of Babylon, in, in, in what's now southern Iraq, um, because they would not follow the gods of their fathers who were in Chaldea, for they had left the ways of their ancestors, and they worshipped the god of heaven, the god whom they had come to know. Hence they, the Chaldeans, drove them out from the presence of their gods and they fled to Mesopotamia, northern Mesopotamia, and lived there for a long time. Then their god commanded them to leave the place where they were living and go to the land of Canaan. So the author of the book of Judith doesn't have this general mention Abraham by name. In fact, he calls them in the plural, he calls Abraham or refers to him in the plural as they. But this is clearly that tradition that Abraham at some point would not follow the gods of his fathers who were in Chaldea. And so they, because he had come to understand that, uh, to worship the God of heaven, the one true God, and that's why uh, he uh, had to leave Chaldea. Well, uh, that's uh, the basis of this tradition that maybe some of you learned in, in uh, Sunday school or, you know, uh, uh, Talmud Torah. Uh, uh, every uh, Jewish uh, child in those circumstances is told that Abraham was the first monotheist and his father, Terah, was an idol worshiper. There are lots of other texts. I, you know, I, I had to keep my eye on the time, so I couldn't give you all of this. But uh, I wanted to give you a sample of another author uh, who's just a wonderful Jewish thinker who had been basically neglected by Judaism because uh, he had the misfortune of writing in Greek. Um, and uh, um, uh, so he was terribly influential on Greek-speaking Jews, but when they died out, it was only Greek-speaking Christians that uh, knew him. But uh, he was sort of rediscovered by the Jews uh, uh, in Renaissance Italy and then, you know, ever after has been studied. He um, was not only a great scholar, but a kind of community leader. He lived um, uh, from, you know, we don't really know his dates, but maybe 30 before the Common Era to uh, 50 or so of the Common Era as um, students like to say, in one era and out the other. Uh, but um, uh, his way of reading scripture was highly allegorical, and that was certainly influenced by, you know, he had a very good Greek education. He's not like Josephus. He writes beautifully mellifluent Greek. Um, uh, but here's what he says 
about uh, his, it's really about his method of reading the Bible. The migrations of Abraham are set forth by the literal text of the scriptures. They're made by a man of wisdom, namely Abraham. But according to the laws of allegory, by a virtue-loving soul in its search for the true God. And that, in one sentence, tells you everything you really need to know about Philo. Uh, the text has an underlying layer of meaning. Uh, the literal te text exists. Sure, there was somebody named Abraham. He did all that they said. But that's not important. What's important is that Abraham, we're meant to understand that Abraham r represents any soul of some person um, in search for the true God. And, uh, and uh, indeed, that, uh, that makes this text uh, not just history, but, um, uh, but it talks to me. I mean, I have a soul, and it's in search of God. So I guess Abraham's story is my story. That's what he wants to tell you. And then he explains, the Chaldeans were especially active in the elaboration of astrology and ascribed everything to the movements of the stars. And that's true. We know those ancient Babylonians were extraordinary uh, astronomers. We have their text now, and, uh, you know, they were, uh, you know, just great. They, they, the, the Greeks were good at, at a lot of things, at math and, well, you know, all the things they were good at. But they were lousy at, at, at astronomy because of the way they thought, you know. And the, the thing is, you know, in astronomy, nothing really works out to even numbers. <laughs> and, uh, and that uh, certainly bothered people's sensibilities, especially Greek sensibilities. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I, I couldn't give you this passage from Josephus. I, I had to keep it down. But, uh, but Josephus has this wonderful thing in which he says, uh, you know, there are 365.25 days in the solar year. They knew that. They had known that for centuries. Um, but he says, what an embarrassing number. I mean, <laughs> why, why would, you know, if the sun were really in charge of things, as a lot of people still believe, uh, you know, um, uh, why would it assign itself this stupid number, 365? So this just shows the sun is not in charge. And the moon, you know, the moon can't get the sun to obey its 12 lunar months because uh, then the solar year ought to have been 354 days instead of 365. So obviously uh, uh, the moon is not in charge and so forth. These embarrassing numbers were given out by the secret creator of the world, says Josephus. Um, um, Philo has a slightly different take, and he's living, you know, a generation or so before Josephus. The Chaldeans were especially active in astrology. They supposed that the course of the phenomena of the world is guided by influences contained in numbers and numerical proportions. They thus glorified visible existence, leaving out of consideration that which is intelligible but invisible, and so forth. So I don't want to read the whole passage, but this is his allegorical way of reading the Bible, and uh, it's really uh, quite stunning. He wasn't, of course, just a biblical commentator, but a philosopher, and uh, no less of an authority than the late uh, Harry Wolfson uh, of Harvard uh, claimed that he was really the beginning of religious philosophy. Well, I want to rush on to the story, not, that was Abraham leaving uh, Chaldea, but then there's this story I don't even need to tell you about because you already know it, the story of Abraham offering or being commanded by God to offer his uh, son Isaac uh, on an altar to essentially make him into a human sacrifice. Um, and um, well, well, what do you think was the big question arising out of this biblical account? Uh, I, I would advise you to forget any sermon you ever heard about this, because <laughs> that wasn't the point. <laughs> uh, at least for, for ancient interpreters, the big question was, why should God need to test Abraham? Didn't he know how the test was going to come out before it started? And so, uh, really, uh, you know, why put the poor guy through all this? He actually goes all the way to the land of Moriah, wherever that is, and builds the altar and puts, um, uh, you know, his son on the altar. And then uh, God, uh, you know, his, God's angel cries out to him and says, stop. But, you know, certainly his heart was in his throat. Why did he do that? And um, 
Now, the answer to this question comes, uh, uh, again, he didn't make this up, but it's found in my favorite book in this literature, the Book of Jubilees. Um, and he says, in a certain year, there were words in heaven regarding Abraham that he was faithful in everything uh, that he told that he God had told him that the Lord loved him, and that in every difficulty he was faithful. Then Satan, who's called in this book the Prince Mastema, Mastema is a rather fancy Hebrew word for hatred, you know, kind of the Prince of Loathing, came and said before God. Abraham does indeed love his son Isaac and finds him more pleasing than anyone else. Tell him to offer him as a sacrifice on an altar. Then you will see whether he performs this order and you will know whether he is faithful in everything through which you test him. Now the Lord was aware that Abraham was faithful in every difficulty which he had told him. For he had tested him through his land and famine and so on and so forth. In everything in which he tested him, he was found faithful. He himself did not grow impatient, nor was he slow to act, for he was faithful and one who loved God. So then the Lord said to Abraham, Take your son, your dear one whom you love, Isaac, and go to a high land. Offer him on one of the mountains. Well, so how does this answer that question? Why did, didn't God know? You know, didn't God know how this sacrifice was going to turn out um, uh, before it happened? So why did he put Abraham through it? And, and the answer of the book of Jubilees and lots of other ancient uh, texts say the same thing. Uh, it was because Satan was challenging him. And uh, so he, uh, this is very much like the book of Job. If you're familiar with that biblical book there, Job is God's, you know, faithful servant, and Satan says, you think he's so hot? You know, uh, afflict him a little bit, and you know, he'll scream like anybody else. He'll curse you out. And um, so that's the beginning of that book. Here, obviously, the author of Jubilees knew the book of Job and imitated it. But you could ask him the question that, you know, you always ask these ancient interpreters. Uh, how can you make it? It doesn't say that. There's no Satan in the biblical story. Are you just making this stuff up? And the author of Jubilees, who I know quite well, um, <laughs> he, he had the answer they all did. I'm not making anything up. And, uh, you know, if you pressed him, he would make you turn back to the um, f uh, previous page. The story begins, after these things, God tested Abraham. Well, uh, it's a, a you know, fortunate coincidence that in biblical Hebrew, the word for things is also the word for word, words. So you could read this as if it were saying, after these words. So then the question is, what words? And since the Bible didn't mention any words other than in this phrase, the author of Jubilees felt um, free to tell you what those words were. So he says, in this year, there were words in heaven regarding Abraham that he was faithful in everything that he told him. And having heard these words, Satan is now aroused against Abraham. He says, you think he's so great, just the way he said about Job. Well, put him to the test, ask him to sacrifice his son. Um, so God did know uh, how the test was going to turn out. There's only one hitch in that. Again, I'm sort of back at the biblical text. Um, having arrived at the mountain, this is the second paragraph, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in, the, in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called him uh, from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Well, now I know means I didn't know before. Uh, so if you claim that he knew how this test was going to come out, how could he say, now, now I know, ata yadati, that, um, that you fear God. So, um, but don't worry, the author of Jubilees is on to it. 
so here's his retelling of it. Uh, having arrived at the mountain, he tied up his son Isaac, placed him on the wood which was on the altar, and reached out his hand to take the knife in order to sacrifice his son Isaac. Then I, the angelic narrator of the Book of Jubilees, stood in front of him and stood in front of Satan. So the Lord said, tell him not to let his hand go down on the child, nor to do anything to him, because I know that he is one who fears the Lord. He's a, this guy just loves these little subtleties. He writes, Be, because I know. He doesn't say, because now I know. In fact, this whole sentence doesn't appear in the Bible. In the Bible, the angel cries out from heaven and says, now I know that you are one who feels the Lord. But here we get Abraham's instructions. He's telling the angel what to say. And it differs from what the angel says in one word, now. He doesn't say now. He says, I know. I always knew this guy was faithful. I didn't need this whole test. But the angel, of course, didn't know. Angels, at least in the eyes of the author of the Book of Jubilees, are quite separate from God. So, so uh, the angel could quite naturally say, now I know because I didn't know before, even though, of course, you, God, did. So that was his answer um, to this um, uh, troubling question. In fact, he had two. Uh, there was another, this is a kind of technical matter, but uh, one of the greatest boons to ancient biblical interpretation was the fact that um, it uh, didn't come with those little dots and, and dashes that indicate the vowels uh, in Hebrew. So that gave you a certain amount of freedom if you were an interpreter. You could read it some other way. And uh, what, what he, when he says, now I know, in Hebrew, he says, ata yadati, now I know, or even have known. Uh, but, um, uh, but you could pronounce those letters a little bit differently. You could say, ata yidati, now I have made known. I always knew, but now I've made it known. And uh, so that's what he says in the very last sentence I, I, I put in here. I have made known to everyone that you are faithful to me in everything that I have told you. So, so that's... He, you know, and this happens. I, I, uh, there are often in this literature uh, two answers to the same question. Uh, you know, a great scholar, me, once called this uh, overkill. And it's a, it's a feature of these, you know, ancient biblical interpreters because that one lesson or one answer to a question they learned in school, and the other, uh, the you know. Um, uh, brother-in-law of uh, his sister's uh, barber, uh, and, uh, you know, figured this out on his own, and he didn't want to insult him, or he thought that wasn't a bad explanation either, so he included both. So here are two explanations. One is that angels are different from God. God did know, the angel didn't know. And the other answer is, now I know didn't really mean now I know, it meant now I have made known. Well, really, the very last item, which I don't uh, intend to talk about for too long, uh, but I wanted to give you an example of something from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, and this one is, is full of personal uh, significance for me. It's a, it's a text called, you know, pseudo-jubilees. Scholars are so insulting. Uh, it, it isn't, you know, it's just that they made the mistake when they first, um, uh, you know, looked at this text sometime in the 1960s. And it looked like the Book of Jubilees. It also referred to Satan as the Prince of Mastema. Um, uh, so they thought it would, but then they looked at the Book of Jubilees itself, which we have. It exists uh, in its entirety only in this obscure language called Ge'ez, which is a dialect of ancient Ethiopic. Um, but um, uh, but in, in that text, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, that's what he's called. So it looked like, but, but it wasn't the same thing. You, you can't find exactly the same thing there. What troubled me when this first came out was one little detail that's not in the Bible or in uh, the Book of Jubilees. Uh, it says that when all this is happening, there were two groups of angels uh, in heaven who were watching. 
Um, you can see this in uh, column two, verse five. This is on the last page of the handout. The angels of holiness were standing weeping above him, saying, shall God annihilate his sons from the earth? And the angels of Mastema stood across from them in the heavens, rejoicing and saying, now he is lost. For if Abraham withholds his son, he will be found to be false. And if not, he will be found faithful, but his son will die. Why did this bother me? Because I actually knew this tradition, as I'm sure a lot of people did. Uh, it's a rabbinic tradition that when, uh, when a Abraham is about to slay his son, the angels in heaven are weeping. And I, I always thought this, you know, it sounds like a typical, you know, midrash of the rabbis. You know, they, they like to bring in verses from elsewhere. And in this case, they brought in a verse from Isaiah that talked about angels weeping. And they also said, uh, you, you know, that uh, their tear, the tears of the angels fell down on Abraham's uh, sword or knife. And consequently, he was, uh, you know, uh, unable to uh, slay his son. But here it is in a text that comes, you know, it's at least 200 years before uh, the earliest attestation of uh, that Midrashic motif. And it really bothered me. Uh, you know, why? Uh, where did this guy get this idea? And there isn't anything in the text to suggest that. Um, and I remember one night I, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night and I... I realized I had the right answer to this problem. And uh, I went back to sleep, and I got up the next morning, and I couldn't remember a thing. <laughs> and I mean, to make matters worse, uh, this was happening when, you know, this happens in Israel. All the university professors go on strike at the same time, and we were on strike. And, uh, and uh, I remember hearing a professor being interviewed on the radio, and the you know, interviewer said, you know, you professors, I mean, you know, how many hours a week do you work that you deserve a raise? And, you know, you maybe work six hours, eight hours, and, and do you really think you should have more money for that? And, and the, the guy answered very well. He said, uh, he said uh, uh, well, that's when we teach and we pass on our ideas to students, but all the rest of the time, we're thinking about, you know, different problems. And he said, you know, on your pajamas, you may have noticed that you have that little pocket on the shirt. When you go to sleep, it, it's empty. But when a professor goes to sleep, it has a little pencil in it. Uh, <laughs> in case he wakes up and, you know, has some great idea, he should jot it down. And, of course, I didn't. But. Uh, uh, and, and I do say it did take another month or two, but I did finally come up with what I think is the right answer. And the right answer is this guy wasn't writing just about the biblical text, but he was writing about the Book of Jubilees, which a lot of people thought ought to be part of the Bible back then. And what bothered him was that second uh, explanation for uh, God's actions, right? He says, not, don't read the text as if it says, Atta yadati, now I know that you are one who fears God, but Atta yidati, now I've made it known. Uh, and the problem is, of course, he couldn't, they didn't have that system of dots and dashes. So how could he make you know as a reader that you should read it as yidati and not yadati? So he added a word. He said, Atta yidati lakol, now I've explained to everyone that you are one who fears God. Because you can't say, now I know to everyone. You have to I have informed, I have made known to everyone. So um, that's what he wrote in the Book of Jubilees. But then along came this guy, the anonymous author of Pseudo-Jubilees, and he said, wait a minute. Who did he make it? Who are all these people who he made it known to? Who was there? There was Abraham. Abraham certainly knew he was one who feared God. Uh, there was Isaac, who probably knew by then as well. And then there was Satan, one person. So why does it say to everyone? So he said, ah, there must have been a lot of angels who were watching also. And out of that came the tradition of um, these good and bad angels. Well, these are just, you know, a few little examples of the way these people interpreted the text. But one of the insights that we gained in 
putting together this uh, anthology was just how many people and how many different literary genres were interested in doing just this, in, in explaining the biblical text or passing on their explanations to later generations. And frankly, they may not have all been loved by our rabbis, but those explanations in one way or another uh, made it, uh, for at least some of them, into the great uh, Jewish interpretive tradition. Without that, I really don't think we would have the same Bible. Thank you very much. Do we have some time for questions? Yes. Okay. Please, anyone. We uh, this... invite, uh, about 10 minutes of, of questions now, and then we will wrap up. So uh, please direct any questions, biblical or otherwise, to our teacher, Professor Kugel. Now, I have to say, this is always a kind of awkward moment because uh, nobody wants to raise their hand. So I always say what I used to say to my students at Bar Ilan. Uh, there are no such things as, uh, as stupid questions, only stupid questioners. They just put them right at ease, you know. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> Well, I, I'm, I'm glad if I've persuaded you that uh, that interpretation is what Joshua had in mind, although I, I must tell you, I don't think so. I think Joshua, you know, when you're living way back in the time when the book of Joshua was being put together, you could make this stuff up on your own. And I don't think he was particularly thinking about Genesis 12 and the question of why God was promising him all these things. He was just saying, yeah, those people on the other side of the river, they are a bunch of idolaters, and that's where we came from. But then God kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, corrected uh, Abraham's uh, uh, thoughts and, and brought him to the land of Canaan, and it's here that my worship has flourished. Uh, that, that's how I would see it anyway. Yes, please. Well, as I said, I, I think I know the author of uh, Jubilees pretty well, but, but we just don't know his name. Uh, and that is true of you know, the vast majority of the texts that we have. I, what, what is tr quite exceptional is that uh, I mentioned Josephus, and we do know his name. And um, we know the name of Ben Sira, uh, as I was saying uh, you know, earlier. Uh, um, you know, if only Ben Sira had been truly wise, he would have signed his book King Solomon, and it would be part of our Bible. But uh, he said, "I am Ben Sira, or rather his grandson." I said so. So um, we um, um, uh, we know his name. Most of the people are just anonymous. We don't don't know who they are. Yes, please. Well, that's a, a very good question, and I think it's one that doesn't have a single answer. I think the author of the book of Judith was just writing this kind of adventure tale, and rather, I wouldn't say quite by accident, but without uh, intending too much by it, quoted a few things he had learned when he was studying the Bible, or studying the Torah. <clears throat> uh, and. Uh, uh, that's true of a lot of these people. Um, I, uh, um, one of the dissertations I directed at Bar Ilan uh, was dedicated to what the author, I thought, um, uh, wisely called uh, uh, Parshanut Agavit, uh, biblical commentary that's, um, uh, well, Agav is sort of what you say, you know, the by the way. It wasn't really uh, the main purpose of writing, but um, by the way, in the process of writing a prayer or uh, writing some other story, 
uh, they brought in a bit of biblical interpretation. And it's really thanks to that that we can try to piece together how people understood the Bible in this period. Yes, please. Well, um, I guess it depends what the subject is. When it comes to his own exploits, he was fairly uh, honest, uh, but I'm sure there were elaborations. Uh, but when he comes to talking about uh, what he calls the three great philosophies of Judaism, uh, um, he describes how he studied with, uh, with the, the Essenes. And I, I, th I think most uh, Josephus scholars take that as, you know, pretty straight from the shoulder, um, uh, you know, account of what went on. Yeah. Yes. Can you say a word about how you know that the biblical text was primary and these are interpretations and not that the biblical text is, you know, missing some of the other things that these are also ancient uh, or as ancient traditions? Well, um, we, we can uh, date these texts uh, uh, pretty well. It, you know, scholars do this. Um, there, there are, it's not there's great unanimity, but basically you can kind of triangulate what was written by, you know, the second century and what came a little bit later in the first century and then you know, before the common era and so forth. Um, Sometimes we get that wrong. Um, I shouldn't say we. I, I don't think I've ever been wrong, but uh, other, other people, you know, have. Uh, so um, uh, uh, the process goes on, actually. Uh, it's going to go on as it does every year at this great conclave uh, of the Society of Biblical Literature, which is taking place uh, next week. But. Um, um, uh, I, I, th I think um, it would be very difficult to, you know, move any of this material way back. Probably the latest parts of the Bible uh, include uh, at least a part of the book of Daniel. And Daniel is, uh, I would say, uh, um, really almost the only um, biblical writer who's also a biblical interpreter. Uh, at least in any way that we can establish for sure. Again, the terms here are kind of tricky because um, if you go back far enough, there was no canonical set of texts. And if you go back before that, it is fairly easy to see um, some process of reinterpretation, rewriting, even within areas such as biblical law. So, um, but, but these guys come, I, I guess, well after that, and you can see it in their writing. Yes? Um, why were some of these books um, uh, excluded? And, and uh, in the case of, of Jubilees, the, the problem was that he, uh, the author, uh, espoused um, doctrines, especially positions on Jewish law that were unacceptable to our rabbis. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite sure uh, if Rabbi Akiva were around, he would, he would be very unhappy with the fact that we're republishing again um, the book of, of Jubilees. He didn't, you know, he, 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 he would have thrown it into the fire. But it was because he, um, the author of Jubilees, espoused a calendar that was opposed to the calendar that the rabbis believed in. Uh, we, we, you know, I. I suppose I shouldn't say this, but I would, I would be very happy if, if uh, we had the calendar of the Book of Jubilees because it was based on a, uh, on a kind of, it was a Sabbath-based calendar. So there were exactly 364 days in every year. And then when you had to 
add something to make it catch up with the sun. It, w it wasn't a whole month as in our um, you know, current Jewish calendar. It was, you know, you had to add uh, maybe uh, one day at the end of each year or uh, somehow otherwise catch up after five years. But um, um, uh, it, it would be, you know, a very convenient calendar for us to use today. I mean, I'm sure you've all noticed that the Jewish holidays somehow never seem to be on time. They're, they're, the Rosh Hashanah is very early this year, or it's very late this year. Oh, that, well, that wouldn't happen with, uh, you know, with the Jubilees calendar. But they, you know, it was for reasons like that. Others, like the Book of Judas, is nice. It's a nice story, uh, but it seems to get some of its facts wrong. It describes Nebuchadnezzar as an, uh, the king of Assyria, which he wasn't, and. Uh, um, and other things. So there's no one global answer. It went on a text by text uh, basis. Uh, but these are the rejects, the, you know, salon de refusé, as they call them. Anyway, other questions? What a tame group. Yes, please. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting question, I, but I, I really can't imagine that any of these authors uh, would uh, be content with saying that Abraham was just searching for the truth. Uh, they would all want to maintain that he found the truth, and that's what's contained in the rest of the Torah. Um, but they, they certainly adopted this tradition, even if they uh, rejected these particular texts, early texts, that reflect it. Last question, in the back, Well, I, I don't know that they did. I, I, and maybe uh, th this isn't uh, a great example, uh, but I'd say um, th the idea that these stories, you know, uh, or the retelling of these stories somehow um, failed to describe uh, uh, God's uh, graciousness towards human beings. Um, I, I, I don't see that. I, I think on the contrary, if they do anything, they um, seek to celebrate that uh, as much or more than biblical texts. Okay, thank you. Professor Kugel, I, I want to thank you for filling the gap, and I mean that as, as a compliment. Anybody who spent time in London knows that at every station on the tube they say, mind, mind the gap. gap. Yes. <laughs> and we, we, we are doing that, giving a little glimpse into this incredibly diverse and rich period of Jewish history. Professor Lawrence Schiffman will be here on December 5th to continue this uh, process. Thank you for supporting this evening. To everyone, happy Thanksgiving a cup. <laughs> Thanksgiving and Hanukkah. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.